Hey guys, this is going to be a tutorial on the path method. Now this is a tutorial I've wanted to do for a long time, but we sort of needed to lay quite a solid formwork of using Grasshopper before we could get into it, because the path mapper can get quite complex in terms of what you can do with it. So, okay, let's start by grabbing the path mapper. The path mapper is found in the sets tab under tree path mapper. And this can basically replace the functions of your graft tree, your flatten tree, your um, your flip matrix, your shift paths, and uh, your simplify, and a couple of other things. But these are the main ones we're going to look at in this tutorial. So we're going to start by just creating a series component. And so the way we use the path mapper is we plug something in. And generally, you always want to see what your data structure is looking like before and after the path mapper. So by default, it is not going to change anything. That That's all well and good. Um, we also, anytime we want to use the path mapper, we need to create null mapping. And so that'll basically take our index input, and that'll, that'll plug a plug the values in here and out and spit out the exact same thing. So we have 0, 0 and A and B correspond to these two numbers respectively. Um, so what can we do with the path level? Let's say we wanted to graft this input. Um, if we plug that into our list, we'll see we get 10 lists each with one item. If we right click on the path mapper and we create graft mapping, we plug that in, you can see we get an identical result. And so what's actually happening here with this with this graph mapping? This is probably the the best way to, to actually visualize what the graph tree does. It takes okay, it takes each item index. So anytime you want to access the item index in a data tree, you need to create this uh, open open bracket i close bracket outside the curly braces because this is where the item index is located and then we're basically putting that on its own uh, on its own branch so for every single index number um, it gets its own branch which is exactly what we see there now the, uh, the simplify let's say we were to plug this into here and then plug that into there you'll see that gets rid of our our zeros in the beginning, and we could quite similarly do that just by jumping in here and getting rid of our A and B. And there we go. That's how you simplify. Now how about flattening? When you flatten something, all you're doing is completely removing that data structure. So we could take this, we could quite, quite simply just set it to zero. Of course, because this is, oh, that's, that's all the flatten output can do, but maybe we wanted to make this 57, and you can just as easily do that. Um, now the path, flip matrix and path shift, we need we need a bit more, we need some data structure in order to be able to work with that. So what we're going to do is we're going to cross-reference the series component against itself three times. And using that, we are going to create some points. At this point, I'm also going to I'm going to throw down two sliders. One of them for my count, I'll set that to ten, and another one for my step size, which will just be a floating point slider. And maybe I want that down around five somewhere. Then I can plug in my x, y, and z. Actually, I'll make that a little bit bigger. All right. So we we'll plug that into there, and we will create our null mapping. So the best way to visualize what's going to happen here is with a polyline. And we'll also bring in a point list component. We're going to plug these points in here and turn the point preview off. Um, point preview is still on somewhere. Where is it on? 
That's odd. All right, we'll just get rid of those. Keep our path method there. Okay, so what the polyline has done at the moment is it has created polyline through all 1,000 points. And, you know, maybe that's not necessarily what we want. So what we can do is we can use the... Uh, we can use the information that we know about this data tree. We know that uh, there are 10 by 10 by 10 items in this list. So what we could do is we could use the uh, what's called the modulo function. It looks like a percentage sign because well, you are using a percentage sign. And what this what modulo basically does is it finds the remainder. So if I were to take 6 modulo 10, that would return 6. If I were to take 16 modulo 10, that would also give me 6. If I were to take 26 modulo 10, that would also return 6. And so, ah, sorry, I, I forgot to uh, bring in my i on my index number on the side, but as soon as we do that, we should now get 10 branches, each with 100 points. And you know what, that's not quite what I wanted. What I wanted was a hundred lists with ten points, like so. So there we go, there is our list of vertical lines. Now we could also, uh, we could also take this and we could go i divided by ten. Now uh, this might do something a bit funky at first, but I'll show you how to fix that, don't worry. You can see that it's uh, it's messing up our data structure a little, and we're getting six points followed by nine, eleven, nine, eleven, and then right at the bottom we get five, and that's just because of a weird sort of rounding uh, issue. So what we need to do is we need to take the floor of i over ten. As soon as we take the floor of i over ten, it's gonna it's gonna basically round these to their lowest integer value, which is actually gonna fix the problem. There we go. 100 branches, each with 10 items. And as soon as we plug that in, we now get a list of polylines in a different direction. We could also, if we wanted to create polylines, so we have polylines going in the vertical direction, or in the Z, we have polylines going in the X, what if we want polylines going in the Y? What we need to do is floor of I over 10, or is it, I think it'll be I over 100, uh, semicolon, I modulo 10. Let's see. Looks to be working so far. And there we go. There are our Y direction polylines. All right, so now, now we can talk about the shift paths and the flip matrix. So the flip matrix is quite a useful component if you've only got a two-dimensional data structure. Two-dimensional data structure is one such as this, where we have one list of index numbers, and we have one, uh, one list of path indices and one list of item indices. So if we were to flip this matrix, I'm going to turn my points off. As, oh my, yeah, I'm going to turn those off for now. If we were to flip that matrix and then plug it in here, what it's going to do is it's going to turn these 100 lists, 100 branches of 10 items each into 10 branches each with 100 items. And so that's all well and good. That might have been what we wanted. But with this three-dimensional data structure, that is most definitely not what we want. So uh, we're going to try plug in this path mapper here, which has created a three-dimensional data structure. You can see we've got, there we go, we've got one index here, another index here, and our third index here. But as soon as we plug this into our flip matrix, it's going to throw an error. And the error is all parts must only differ at a single locus. So this differs at a single locus because it's only a two-dimensional data structure. But if you plug in a three-dimensional data structure, the flip matrix doesn't know which way you want to flip that, whether you want to swap these two, or this and this, or this and this. It really doesn't know. So it kind of becomes useless at this point. And that's where this is where the path mapper really comes into its own. Because we can create null mapping here, and then we'll bring in our i like we did before. 
and then we can just change this any which way we want. So I might go B I. So this puts every index or uh, every uh, index item number on its own list, but it also um, completely dismantles the structure that we have in this first item. So you can see we've turned these y directional lines, uh, um, yes, these y directional lines into these z directional lines. Alternatively, we could go i semicolon a, and that'll turn. Actually, I should have made a copy of that. Yeah. So we have. So we now have. Y direction, Z direction, and X direction. Alright, now what about the shift paths? I mean, should you want to? The shift, all the shift paths requires you to do is if we create our null mapping, all you need to do is just get rid of either your A or your B value. Um, with the shift paths, we only have, oops, sorry, this one here. With the shift paths, we only have the option of how far to offset the branch. Whereas with the path mapper, we can choose which one of these branches we are offsetting. So if I were to put a polyline through all of these, you'll see they're going in this direction. But with the path mapper, I can create them either in the same direction as the shift paths, or I can create them in the opposite direction. Or I could go even further and I could create them in the third direction because we've got that three dimensional data structure. And there you go. So I hope this is. Uh, Actually, before I before I wrap this up, I'll also show you that um, what uh, you might you might be thinking. Well, if I change my um like my count over here, this is really going to mess up the data structure. Well, thankfully, there's a way around that. You see, we have these um these item count, path count, and path index numbers here. So I could go in here and I've got my ABI. Let me see. So if I wanted to keep my data structure, I just need to take the, let's see, it would be I over the item count raised to the power of 1 over 3. Um, if you are, yes, raising anything to a fraction will find the root of that number. So this is trying to find the cubic root because we've got that three-dimensional data structure. So as soon as I plug these polylines in here, you'll be able to see that if I, um, if I sort of vary these numbers, that this will update automatically, whereas if I were to plug this in here, my data structure completely breaks because I've assigned a fixed number. So this is a really good way to keep your uh, your path mapper parametric as well. Um, we'll probably look at this method uh, a little uh, in a little bit greater detail in some further tutorials. But this is just the first use of the path mapper. So that's that's about all I want to show for now before we get into some other tutorials. Cool. Thanks for watching.